when I came to serve as the Council General of China to, uh, in Mumbai, I was uh, the Vice President of China Institute of International Studies, which is the think tank to advise the Chinese leaders. I uh, watched this whole scenario that was evolved in the Middle East, or in the, in, in the Arab world in North Africa. We call it uh, uh, MENA, as you call it, MENA region. Now we have to really think of it, what do we call this? Quote, and I quote, movement, democrat, uh, democratic movement. To me, it's not a rebellion. It's not a movement. It's not a revolution either. It's a cluster of group of political forces standing together in search for their identity, in search for change, in search for a better future, which they are not going to see any time in the future yet. So if we call it a democratic movement, it's no longer democratic by any terms, as my uh, friend Jay just mentioned. So it's not a democratic movement, definitely by whatever means. Uh, it's not a revolution. Revolutions are mean, uh, the two means, military or civilian means, for a peaceful transfer of governments and powers. It realizing it, but it, it, it is gone again, right? So it's not a revolution. So how do we call it? I think it's still subject to question. Now, we have to, as I look at it, the dust of the Arab Spring is down. But the legacy is still lingering on. More than that, it grows into ferocity. It's turned more violent, more militant more deviating away from the traditional sense of a movement for a change. So this is kind of the thing we have to really think about. Now, as I look at it, I uh, did make a few notes. I don't want to because I'm not supposed to, uh, to invite you to make a speech. I just uh, share my uh, thoughts in outline forms. We have to revisit this whole thing, which happened quite a few years ago in, in the uh, MENA region. These are the things we have to look at. These are the legacies. The first one is, you know, uh, the street revolts, I call it. I think at the outset I call it street revolts. I hate to call it revolution. I don't agree to this. Revolution is something for meaning. It's not a meaning by any standards. So this whole thing has caused the regional political and social turmoil, which is still evolving. It's not gone yet. It's expanding. I thought it would be, con it would be contained in the MENA region, but now it's, I heard the, the news, uh, some Indian young guys uh, have joined the forces. It's spreading to China. You see? The, the vicious thing is when the cells are there, they grow. This is the scenario, the worst scenario we have to watch. The, the first thing. And the second thing is, uh, it has caused the change of the political landscape of the region, the sub-region, the whole region, and the whole world. Now the international community, I think I agree with Jay, uh, that we international community does have to regard it seriously. We have a saying, when you want to do something, nip it in the butt. If you do it too early, it's too late to do anything about it. So this is the consequences that we have to watch it all very seriously. And the third thing is, uh, it, it has induced the militant means, otherwise we're not very popular in the Arab world, especially for the Muslims, cultures and the civilization. It, in the Muslim world, to which I'm a member from, because uh, uh, <laughs> I have uh, so many uh, Muslim friends, I know their culture. You know, it has induced the regional turmoils in, in achieving their results or aspirations. 
by the extremist means. So this is the third thing is, it's, it has become the breeding ground for extremists, for terrorists. They are using, as Jay said, using their military purposes to realize what you know, their you know, means. So these are the four legacies that we have to watch very closely. And now the second question I want to share with you. The second point is why? I think we have a very good uh, topic. Why are West Asia and North Africa in turmoil? Uh, we, as uh, we have seen, doctors would have to find out the symptoms before we give out the, 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 the uh, prescriptions. What are the, 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 the symptoms? We have to diagnose it. Oh, it's a kind of postmodern. We still have to give it proper diagnosis before we say, oh, this is something we came across, like Ebola. We have to die out, you know, diagnose the symptoms. Well, let me just uh, be quick. You know, uh, these are the reasons that I see why they reduce. I, I think probably Jay uh, didn't have the time, you know, uh, to run into that. The reason, I'm an economist by profession, so I'm basically from the political economic uh, perspective, just to share with you, be it wrong or right, just for your reference. The first one is, you know, the tangible, sustainable national economic development has to be sustainable. When you look at all those problematic countries, do you find any country that is sustainable in this way? This is the root cause. We have seen poverty breeds the extremists or terrorists. This has become exactly the same scenario. But you say Libya used to be a war rich country. Why also? It's broken down to pieces and uh, falling into pieces, falling into a warlord state. Syria was used to be a be peaceful, quiet, relatively comfortable nation. Now you see what happens. So this is whole thing, the falling behind of economic and social progress is the key thing. Without exception. Those uh, problem, uh, problematic countries fall into this category. I wonder if you would agree to this. And the second one is we have to look at the world, global map. You know, each and, a, each and every nation would have to fully participate in the division and of labor according to these factors, capital, technology, Production capability, information, and human capital. Look at all those countries. They just simply do not have those effective means to participate in the global division chain. As a result, many of those countries are left out of the globalization. They become the marginalized nations. It is in those states, quote and unquote, the failed states that these scenarios happened. I'm sure you, you, my experts would agree with me here. So the second thing is globalization has something to play in this regard. And the third symptom I diagnose is that, uh, you know, any nations or any responsible leaders would have to make sure to produce three means before they are qualified as a, you know, legal or uh, eligibly lead, uh, elected leaders. You know, the first one is a sustainable roadmap strategy for national development. Well, I uh, do suppose with the democratic uh, movement, with the transfer of the, uh, you know, of the traditional political system into Western-styled democracy, the periodical change of governments are transparent. People are sure to have one people, one vote. Oh, yes. I agree with you, my dear friend. But democracy is not simply equals to one people, one vote. I want to quote one famous people. You know, the former World Bank president. He said one sentence. Democracy cannot feel a hungry stomach, which is becoming a huge issue. And this is the issue. So in those 
countries which fallen that fall into the turmoil, there was one thing in common. That is, all the governments failed to draft, to implement the sustainable national development strategy, without exceptions. And because the biggest mistake, political mistake, that the political leaders of a nation make would be the failure to implement or draft and implement a sustainable national development strategy. Number four, I think the, the, the second, the, the down in line is, uh, you know, the economic structure. Without exception, you, you look at all those countries, the economic structures are just monolithic or with no structures at all. People were living on whatever they were given. They were not producing much. When a government, when the economy is not, is not growing, the young people are growing by abundance. When they come into the society, they don't have the jobs and then go to the streets. This is the natural choice they have. So I think uh, the economic strategy is something that we, we should uh, you know, look into. And the fifth one I would look at it is, uh, without exception, I think uh, those countries have the tradition, I think like, like China used to be. They, we call it, uh, you know, continuous leading by one government and one leaders. You know, you know, the senior citizen politicians were great, maybe, but they were no longer in their prime time. People, when they are getting old, they tend to be defensive, they tend to be aggressive in, you know, suppressing the younger generations when they fail. They, we don't, they, when they fail to you know, realize things, they just use the extreme measures to suppress. When this goes on and on, until at one point, they just kick out. They're just kicked out. So this is the, the reason. And the other one, I think, uh, is, uh, I think uh, one thing is also in common, as I found it, the corruption. Governance was an issue. People hate to see the same faces, to see the same policies, to see, to see the same poverty they are in. They have no future. The only way is to go to the street or to go to the booths, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to elect. These are the two things. When these two means are not available, then they, they take whatever means they have. This is what exactly the scenarios that have been happening, not only in the MENA region, it expanding to some other areas. I'm sure Prime Minister Modi and the Chinese President Mr. Xi Jinping has, has made the political you know, decision to join hands to do something before they come. Well, I think uh, I don't want to take long, just uh, five, uh, four points. One, what, shall we, what are the lessons we should learn before, we, before our countries are falling into the battlegrounds for the SI, you know, ISI you know, uh, groups or extreme groups, which are going to happen sooner or later, believe me. Now, I think uh, these are the uh, five points I want to share with you. The first one is the sustainable economic and social development is the most important, the least thing a good government has to do. Jobs are more important or as important as the economic growth. We are very often falling into this paradigm. We see the continuous economic growth, but more and more people are waiting for their jobs. This jobless growth is a new paradigm that the modern leaders would have to worry about. So sustainable economic and social progress. This is the lesson we should learn. And the second one is, uh, you know, in this regard, I think that these are the benchmarks. As an as a, a, a economic doctor, I want to uh, say this for sure. The first one is the productivity. The productivity. Economic scale may grow, yeah. But the, and the competitiveness and the people's living standard. And the second is inflation management. And the third is people's livelihood. And the number four is anti-corruption campaign that is a good governance and we have to do away with the senior 
you know, political leaders. When they stay in power for too long, get them, get rid of them by votes or by revolts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The problem is that when they are about to get power, you are removing them. That's the problem. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. David Akao, Council General of Israel. Sir, I think I was told that diplomats are speaking late, so you can take another 15 minutes. Or so. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, actually, I've been dealing with exactly this issue in the last uh, six years, as uh, like my uh, colleague from China, and actually our organizations are sister organizations, both of us, and uh, we used to have dialogue every year in the last few years, so uh, it's very interesting to meet here in, in this uh, venue, and this is a fascinating uh, discussion. Um, and. I agree with most uh, of what was said here, uh, but I think we're still only touching the tip of the iceberg. I think this issue of what is happening in the Middle East in the last three years is probably one of the most complex historical issues, even in a very long historical comparison. Uh, it is so complicated, and the more I learned about it and I dealt with it on a daily basis for six years, uh, sometimes you just become more confused. So, uh, for instance, uh, I agree with most of what you said, Jay, but the thing is, it's hard to look at this whole area as one uh, homogenic area. There are, the, the countries are so different. The situations are so different. How can you compare Egypt, which is uh, fairly homogenic, uh, and the problems there are grave, but they are different than the problems in Syria and Iraq and Lebanon, where the problems are because it's uh, kind of artificial countries that were created by colonial powers and brought together groups that have nothing in common, and not only that, maybe hate each other's guts. So you really can't compare. And the only thing which is uh, similar is that violence erupted and that there was a sense that something has to change. I, I agree with that completely. Um, so I would like to start with, with one kind of disclaimer. First of all, uh, I come from an organization which is a research and assessment organization in the foreign ministry and I can tell you that this phenomena that happened the Arab Spring, no one, but no one in the world no intelligence organization, no research uh, organization, no university, no expert, no historian, no one forecasted it. Absolutely wrong. So all of us supposedly, supposedly experts, uh, foreign ministry people, academics, journalists, we all have to be more humble <laughs> about our ability to predict and to understand in depth what is really happening. I think everybody will agree with me here about this. Uh, the only thing, we, we used to uh, write this yearly report of what we think could happen, would happen in the next year. Uh, and of course, in the last report before the Arab Spring erupted, we, as any other organization, didn't think that this kind of thing could happen. The only thing we kind of maybe hinted was we wrote for a few years, uh, one after the other, in these reports, that there's a very important report called the UN Arab Human Development Report from 2001. This was a UN commissioned report about the Arab world, which was a very in-depth report. It was written by mostly uh, political scientists and mostly economists from the Arab world. I think most of them were actually Egyptians. And what this report wrote in terms of undercurrents was basically it mentioned every, all the issues that we have now mentioned as reasons for instability. Basically, all the economic problems, the lack of economic horizon, the lack of political horizon, the lack of political freedoms, uh, the uh, monopoly on information, uh, the, uh, the lack of education, 
uh, all of these frustrations, all of these really uh, basic problems were all mentioned there. But it was mentioned there as a very, in a very general sense and in a way that you could understand that there are grave problems in the Arab Middle East, but nobody could know or forecast when all this will emerge. And it turned out that it emerged in 2011. But this is something you can't forecast, uh, you know, and give a pinpoint exactly when it will happen. So th I think this is the only thing people could, could be aware. Uh, in our assessment, what is happening is a truly historic change. I mean, we're not, not talking here of changes that are change of in terms of decades. We are talking here of changes that are in terms of centuries. Many people here are talking about the demise of the Sykes-Picot agreements. Sykes-Picot agreements was what I mentioned, the agreements between the French and the British to basically carve out countries in the Middle East uh, that was done almost exactly 100 years ago. Uh, the, uh, towards the end of the First World War that now we're just mentioning the beginning of it. Um, so we're talking about a whole century. And probably what we are seeing is the crumbling of that order that was, was started then and somehow was kept until now with all kinds of arrangements. Uh, different arrangement in, in any uh, er Arab country, but what you could say that what was pretty much uh, the same in any one of these countries was that there was no democracy. That there was some one kind of uh, autocracy or another. Uh, and you know, some autocrats were uh, more effective, so they were more stable. Uh, and some autocrats were a little less uh, effective. Uh, but this is the way this system uh, kept on going uh, in the last 100 years. Um, but what we are seeing here with this crumbling is uh, basically the breakup of, this, of the model of, of a secular Arab state. The secular Arab state has fallen apart. And what we're seeing, by the way, and I think it wasn't mentioned before, there's a big difference, by the way, between the republics and the monarchies. You have here the map, I think it's very convenient. You, you look at the countries that have the most problems these are the republics. It's Iraq, it's Syria, it's Egypt, uh, it started in Tunisia, it's Libya, uh, while the countries that are monarchies like Saudi Arabia and, and the smaller Gulf states uh, uh, and Jordan and Morocco, uh, which are all monarchies, uh, are fairly stable. Why is it? Our belief is because, first of all, these monarchs have more legitimacy than the secular leaders. Uh, most of them have, are either very closely tied to tradition, whether it's the Bedouin tradition or in Morocco, the Northwest kind of African Sahara uh, traditions, and they also have religious meaning as monarchs. Uh, whether it's the uh, King of Jordan, which is part of, the, uh, of his family, family's roots go back to the uh, prophet uh, or the Moroccan uh, king, or the uh, royal family of Saudi Arabia, which are the keepers of the holy sites. Uh, and of course, when you talk about the Arab Gulf countries, Arab countries, uh, they have a big advantage. They are very rich. And this helps. And what, you, what you've seen for instance, in Saudi Arabia, when the turmoil started, immediately they threw something like $150 billion on their constituency. So you have, when you have this kind of sums that you can just throw at your population, it helps. It helps. So you can add that as, as a reason uh, as well. But it's a completely varied area. So it's very hard to, so it makes it even more complicated to kind of, you know, put specific reasons that will encompass all. Uh, another issue that has not been mentioned here and we believe is very relevant, uh, and not everybody is aware of that, is the huge tension 
between Sunnis and Shiites. This is a major issue that uh, somehow was put under the carpet, but you can't, uh, you can't avoid it. You see it in the, uh, both in the Syrian and in the Iraqi civil war, and you see the enmity and the, the, the religious uh, uh, side of this enmity, and you understand that there's a huge issue here that was not, I guess, treated enough and is not going to go away. And this, uh, and this division between Sunni and Shiites is in a way parallel to the division between Arabs and, and Parsis and Iranians. Uh, so when you see today countries like uh, uh, Saudi Arabia or the small Arab uh, Gulf, Gulf countries, uh, when they look at Iran and are very much afraid of Iran, uh, they are both afraid of Iran as a Shiite country threatening Sunni Islam as they see it, but they also are afraid of Iran as a non-Arab, Parsi entity, culturally different, uh, taking over them as Arab countries. So these two are parallels, but it's a huge factor that you have to take into account in this instability. Another thing that we believe is very important in uh, what happened in the Arab Spring is, uh, has to do with technology and with internet. Uh, both internet, we, we see two things which were very important. One of them, of course, is internet, social networks, etc. Et the second is the power of satellite television. Uh, mostly Al Jazeera, but after that you have new, you have other uh, 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 stations that kind of deliver information to all of the Arab world. You have to take into account that before that, all these autocratic rulers we talked about had a monopoly on information. They could determine what kind of information or what, what goes on in, Ar in other Arab countries or even in the same country or outside in the outside world. They could determine exactly what goes into their population. Once you have internet, once you have satellite TV, this monopoly is over. And suddenly people understand what the real situation is. They understand how they are kept down by autocratic uh, rulers. They, kept, they understand how uh, economic and political rights and opportunities are taken away from them. And of course, that helps their motivation uh, to rise and change their situation. And I think this is one of the major causes uh, to, to the Arab Spring. I completely uh, agree with uh, what Jay, I think, observed uh, as the, I, I think, the two kind of defining uh, factors of what is happening, and that is uh, the search for identity. I think that is really the, the, the base, uh, and I think that kind of defines the, the breakdown that, that we're seeing. There's a clear-cut search for identity. The problem is there's no, uh, there's no one model uh, or even two or three models that are relevant. So on the one hand, there's a search and a need. On the other hand, there are no answers. If some people, let's say in Egypt, thought that uh, Islam is the answer, which is the slogan, actually, of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, after a year, as was said, many of the people who voted for the Muslim Brotherhood wanted them down. So they understood that Islam or a uh, Islamic political organization is not the solution to their problems and not the solution for Egypt. So the problem is, what is the solution? And I think there's a terrible frustration today that there are many people are saying, well, there's no solution. And then maybe you get, as was mentioned here, to this uh, nihilist uh, uh, frame of mind of many people. And that is the big threat, that if there's no solution, then let's just go to senseless, brutal violence, as we see by ISIS, of you know, cutting heads of people, which is terrible. Uh, but it's, it, 
but you know, some people, some frustrated people might go to that direction. And that, I think, is a real, um, a real fear and a real threat. And I think it's a global threat. Uh, you have to take into account that, uh, you know, when you're looking at what is happening in Iraq with ISIS, uh, you know, the Europeans view it as connected directly to them uh, because they had incident of, uh, 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 of terrorism in Europe. You had, of course, September 11th. Uh, you had uh, incidents of terrorism right here in Mumbai. Uh, so everything is connected. I mean, even if you look at uh, Australia, which is so far away, they had a, 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 an, um, an issue of, of terrorism in Bali uh, that targeted uh, Australian, uh, Australian tourists. So, so it's truly a, it can truly have a global effect, and the problem is radicalism and radicalization and the lack of solutions and uh, that's why it's so urgent to hopefully find some kind of solution but I have to say that I am unfortunately not an optimist on this uh, our assessment and I think both of my colleagues here did not seem to be very optimistic either uh, I don't see an easy solution to any of these problems uh, I see instability uh, for the long run in the Middle East generally and I see a process of breaking down uh, and you have to take into account that some things are changing even if they're not declared. Take, into, take for instance, uh, the uh, Kurdish area of Iraq. The Kurdish area of Iraq today for, uh, is basically an independent state, you could say. Yes. So just take uh, that as an example that the change is already there, and even though it's not declared, you already have major changes. So I will stop here and, and thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Only one point I would like to say. What you have mentioned, nobody could predict. But same thing happened in Prussia Rimon. Same thing happened in Soviet disintegration. Same thing, same thing happened in the end of Cold War. Nobody could predict it. So one thing here, only two years ago. Anyway, now our next speaker and main speaker, Sri Kutani. Uh, Your Excellency is uh, Dr. Liu Yufa, <coughs> Mr. David Akov, uh, Mr. Ilyas Savilyev from uh, Russia, Dr. Jos George, Professor Ankush Savan, Dr. Liaquat Khan, and my good friend Jai Deshmukh. Uh, <coughs> we at the Observer Research Foundation are truly pleased. Uh, to partner with the Department of Civics and Politics, Mumbai University, in organizing this, uh, this very informative, educative panel discussion. And we do hope that uh, we'll have more opportunities to partner with uh, your department in the time to come. Friends, uh, I had an opportunity to visit some countries in this region recently, Egypt, Tunisia, very briefly Libya and Turkey. And it is in Egypt that I met my old colleague Jay Deshmukh. We worked together 20 years ago in a newspaper called The Sunday Observer. We had lost touch, and suddenly I get a call from uh, Jay when I was visiting the pyramids. Uh, and it was a very friendly, familiar voice. Uh, we met, and uh, he really enlightened me a lot on the situation in Egypt, just as he has done so now. Friends, it's not easy at all to work as a journalist in that part of the world. He mentioned James Foley, who was his friend and very brutally murdered very recently, just some seven days back. But uh, there is another journalist, Mary Colvin, 
known to Jay, they worked together in Libya, who also was killed in the same region. And I must mention here, friends, that uh, Jay himself encountered a life-threatening situation. And therefore, I would like to, you know, request Jay to narrate that, narrate that incident because without that, this journalistic narration would be incomplete. And thereafter, I'll give my, I'll give my remarks on this subject. Okay, sure, no problem, no problem. Uh, friends, why is this area in turmoil? I see six reasons. One is that uh, we should uh, remember that just like India and our subcontinent, West Asia, what to the Western world is Middle East, West Asia, North Africa has also been or was a victim of colonialism. And as uh, the Israeli Consul General rightly pointed out, when they left, in many places, these colonial powers, they arbitrarily drew national boundaries with no regard to the historical affinities, historical identities of the various peoples living in, these, in this part of the world. I must mention here, and perhaps he may not agree with me here, even the birth of Israel is a part of how the Western powers redrew the, the traditional geography of this region. And this is one of the reasons for the turmoil that we are seeing today. The second reason is that after the European powers left the region, not entirely, but the European powers were anyway a declining colonial entities, the United States stepped in. The United States established, tried to establish its own hegemony. Immediately after the Second World War, this region became the theater of Cold War. The United States had its own uh, areas of influence, and so did the Soviet Union. Iraq, Syria, even Egypt under Nasser, these were the allies of the Soviet Union. And as Professor Savant mentioned, that was a time when many of these governments and also societies traditionally were were secular. Islam was not the rallying point of either the governments or the people. Secularism as the identity of these governments, these regimes, and they were also in some way influenced by the Soviet Union, and therefore they styled themselves as socialist governments. The Ba'ath Party in Iraq the Ba'ath Party in Israel, in, in, sorry, in Syria, even Nasser himself to some extent. But we all know that socialism, it, uh, it receded in the background with the decline of the Soviet Union itself. Two transformative events happened. One in that region itself, one close to that region. The one event that was close to the region was the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1978. That completely destabilized Afghanistan and ultimately led, I mean, it was one of the main factors, not the only factor, for the disintegration of the Soviet Union itself and the end of the communist rule in Russia. The other 
transformative event was the Islamic Revolution in, in Iran, 1979. So that is, that gave not just to the Shias, but also to Sunnis, that Islam can be the answer for mobilizing ourselves, for demanding and getting what we want. Friends, you know, we must remember here that the United States also contributed to the rise of Islamism in no small way because the United States actively encouraged the Taliban, what some of them became Al-Qaeda later, to fight the, the Russian, the Soviets in Afghanistan. And when that war was over, the same people, they became active in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, and of course in many other Arab, Arab countries. So we should not, you know, in, in trying to understand why this area is in turmoil, we should not forget the role of the United States. You know, United States, of course, was a victim of the worst terrorist attack or the most dramatic terrorist attack in human history, 20, you know, 9-11. But United States has also contributed to destabilization and rise of many undemocratic forces, also Islamist forces. The next reason is, as uh, Consul General pointed out, the traditional conflict between Shias and Sunnis. It has not played itself out fully, and we don't know in what other violent ways this conflict will surface, resurface again and again in that region and also elsewhere. The last reason, friends, is the tension between nationalism and Islam. The identity, what is the identity of Egypt? Of course, the majority of the people of Egypt are Muslims. But is Islam the only identity of, of, of Egypt? No. You know, when I was in Cairo, I went to Al-Azhar University. Al-Azhar University is, the, is considered uh, the most prestigious center for Islamic learning in the world. And Sunni, but what he said is it also applies to you know, Persia, Iran. The, the advisor to the grand imam of Al-Azhar University, he said that what the Egyptian revolution or the two revolutions, let's not use the word revolution, but the two big uprisings, what they have done is that Millions and millions of Egyptians, common Egyptians, have now begun to question everything. But the one thing that they will not question, and this is interesting, is their Egyptian nas identity, national identity. Because he said that Egypt has been there even before Islam came for thousands of years. And we are proud of our pre-Islamic identity. Huh? And, you know, this, this, this puzzle of why Egyptian people, a majority of Muslims, why they rebelled against Muslim Brotherhood, even, even after Muslim Brotherhood had won an election, is because somewhere they felt that Muslim Brotherhood was trying to bring in some kind of a global Islamism hmm? and therefore undermining, undermining Egyptian nationalism. You know, their concern was more the global unity of Muslims. And this is something which, which created a big concern among common Egyptians. They are Muslim, but they are also very proudly Egyptian. Now this also, in my opinion, true about Syria. You know, Syria has, has, uh, has witnessed, is witnessing a terrible civil war. 
more than one and a half lakh people have died in this in the civil war so far millions of people have have become refugees but it's not a simple you know sunni versus non non sunni conflict in syria the ruler in syria belongs to a minority within the shia minority the alawite group yet the sunnis of syria many sunnis are fighting with the government in the civil war why because they identify themselves as syrians so the the ident national identity should not be suppressed and the same is true about iran iran is a shia country but they are very proud of their pre islamic persian civilizational identity so any solution to the turmoil in this region has to harmonize people's identity of nationalism as well as of course they are proud muslims but it's a, it's a, it's it's islam that is very very diverse friends you know very recently we had a talk at the observer research foundation by the former indian ambassador in syria rajendra abhyankar and he said something that really startled me that in a small part of syria there are 80 sects of muslims 80 so it's a very diverse islamic society so this this diversity has to be respected which islamic state al qaeda and other such militant extremist groups they they don't believe in that they want to suppress the takfirism you know it's a, a, many of you may not have heard this this term takfirism the extremist muslims calling others that they don't agree with as non muslim you are not a muslim because you don't believe in what i believe in and they hmm? deserve to die and they deserve to die uh, you know just friends you know what is really a sh you know a very startling shocking aspect of this this turmoil is muslims killing muslims you know who is killing whom in 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 iraq of course christians are are targets but uh, a majority of the people who have killed who have been killed are muslims killed by muslims the same is true in syria the same is true in libya so in in some way i see a certain dichotomy here between ethical islam and political islam political islam is in crisis today not only in the arab world but all over the all over the world and it is creating problem not only for muslims but also for non muslims ethical islam of course is is something that it's a great religion and this region of the world has to find solutions to ending the turmoil in ethical islam and not only in ethical islam but also in other great faiths that are born in this region Palestine Israel that that small part of the region is the birthplace of three great religions Judaism Christianity Islam there are very rich civilizations in this part of the world Ottoman Ottoman civilization Persian civilization Arab civilization so you know it might look very bleak the situation and some people might see might say oh there is no optimism there is no scope for hope at all but you know humanity ultimately overcomes challenges the worst of challenges and that is the only way humanity has survived you know i i saw uh, one news report recently of uh, some people in iraq saying that iraq needs an iraqi gandhi a mahatma gandhi you know we need a mahatma gandhi who will of course mahatma gandhi failed but the principle which he espoused which he championed and for which he became a martyr in india that principle will never never die because that's a principle of justice that's a principle of living together of harmony 
in diversity. So, Arab world, West Asia, North Africa, Persia, Turkey, all these countries, including the conflict between Israel and, and Palestine, you know, it, it, uh, you're talking about satellite television, Your Excellency, you know, we see images every day of people, people being killed, children, old people. Obviously, they're not all terrorists. So, uh, you know, on Israel both, on, both on both sides, sides you know, on both sides, both, both sides. So Israel has a, has, has a right to exist, but Palestinians also have a right to a statehood, a viable statehood. They also are entitled to justice and the most basic human right to live. So, the solution has to be found in the, in the wisdom of humanity. I'll end my remarks, friends, by just making one point. The West, the Western powers, European powers and the United States have failed to make any positive contribution to ending this turmoil. In any case, the Western powers are in decline. They are no longer as powerful as they were a few decades ago. And the time has come for India, for China, for Russia, for other countries in the world to become active. And therefore, I'm very happy that at the recent BRICS summit in Brazil, you should read the BRICS declaration. It's one of the finest declarations. Now, a new voice is emerging in the world. That doesn't mean that others, like the United States, like the European powers, are to be excluded. But all of them have to work together to find a solution, or several solutions, harmonizing solutions, and bring peace to this region, because it is the duty of the entire international community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sri Kulkarni. Now, before giving floor to Jai Deshmukh, I will just bring one small rider to your seat. What you have mentioned about Egyptian nationalism, I think the credit goes to Christian, Coptic Christians. They are the minority, because that is the main minority, and this minority is always patriotic, they never. And second, at one stage, Egyptian nationalism, Egyptian nationalism mentioned what Islam has given to us. Language and religion, we don't want both. That type of stage they also want. So that is a strong nationalist, what you have mentioned. They are truly Egyptian nationalists. Yeah. Uh, yes, People should know what happened to you. Uh, this was uh, almost 10 years ago, when I had first gone to Iraq. I had uh, gone for... Uh, Basically, a six-week mission, I had to replace a colleague of mine who was covering the invasion. Uh, he was with the US forces. He went into Iraq, uh, the whole invasion of Saddam, the toppling of Saddam Hussein, and everything. So he was tired, and I had to replace him for some time. So for six weeks, I was told that uh, I was flown from here to there, and please uh, do the reporting there. Now, this was my first time in the Middle East, you know, not just in Iraq, but in the Middle East. No, I don't know any language. I don't have any information firsthand on the ground information. Uh, but we went ahead because these are some of those challenging missions, assignments any upcoming journalists want to uh, want to do. And this was the story of our generation, the biggest story of uh, our generation. And we went, I went there. A few weeks into Iraq and covering uh, stories, a big rebellion erupted from Najaf. Najaf is the holiest place of Shia Islam, the holiest, number one. It is the shrine of Imam Ali. He is buried there, and Imam Ali is the ultimate Imam uh, for Shia Islam. And, it's, and, and, and the rebellion was started by Shia militants against American forces. Now, US at that time was battling several forces within Iraq at the same time. It was battling a Sunni insurgency which had erupted from Saddam loyalists on one hand. Uh, at that time, there was no trace of Al-Qaeda, so I wouldn't mention Al-Qaeda at that time. But then you had internal 
political groups which were also getting influenced slowly slowly by uh, Iran so they were starting to raise their voices and then you had uh, this big militant group from uh, Shia militants and they started this rebellion from Najaf against American forces so we were reporting on so I, I was told to go and do uh, reporting on that particular battle day in and day out and it was going on for weeks so me and my translator my team we were in and out going into the shrine from the crossfire getting hit again going in getting hit again going in and it was one of those days when uh, the number one Shia cleric who is extremely revered now Mr. Uh, Ayatollah Ali Sistani he came back from London to stop the fighting to announce a ceasefire and he was coming into Najaf so when we came to know that uh, that uh, Grand Ayatollah Ali Sistani was coming I rushed to see if I can meet his uh, entourage and meet and try to get some first hand information and when I saw him of course we were stopped but when I saw him I was doing uh, I started giving live reports at that uh, moment which is like outside a bit outside Najaf near Kufa the twin city of Najaf as we call it and I had my laptops my satellite phones everything and I was I just kind of for a split for a minute I lost the basic training you know that we've been trained not to be very obvious when you're doing reports you know be very careful in a situation like this because the entire atmosphere is prejudiced nobody trusts nobody so you have to be very careful when you're doing reporting in such an atmosphere and for a split second uh, whatever happened uh, you know the moment took over me and I was doing my reporting on the satellite phone suddenly we had a group of the six seven black clad militants bouncing on us grabbing us beating us and shoving us into a uh, into a taxi they flagged down a taxi they pulled uh, they uh, pushed me and my uh, translator inside and uh, we were taken blindfolded and taken off into uh, miles outside Kufa and Najaf like into the desert for us and the whole and the entire taxi was full of blood and everything so obviously they were bringing in wounded fighters or people or whatever so it, it, it was mess and we realized that okay we have landed ourselves in a big mess right now so how to get a, was the, the main thing like a drive of half an hour or so into the desert we so we we, we stopped we were uh, we were uh, got out of the car we got out of the car the taxi saw there was this big broken mosque and the door was ripped out big holes uh, pockmarked with bullets and everything and we we realized that okay now we are really in some kind of a deep mess we were pushed into the mosque inside the mosque compound was like the site I will never forget there were like at least 150 to 200 fighters all black clad reckless guns everything that you had anti-aircraft guns and everything they were just loading them and they're all uh, yelling at each other running around instantly immediately I realized that that was kind of an operation center for them from there the fighters were going to the battlefield and then coming back fighting the Americans and coming back so that so so we were taken into the right into the main operation center we were pushed into a into a room locked went you know the group which snatched us they just dumped us and left a couple of hours later we hear, we hear a knock the door opens we are taken out I see a group of a uh, bunch of fighters they start arguing with me I couldn't understand Arabic they couldn't understand English and these are all youngsters you know very reckless sweaty youngsters itching to fight at any at the drop of the hat you know they just wanted to shoot you if you want to you know somebody dabbing a gun at me somebody you know kind of punching me or whatever things were going on now my translator extremely elegant Iraqi gentleman called Salam who was formerly a helicopter pilot with Saddam's forces but after the dismantling of the forces and all he became a translator come journalist with us he was arguing very uh, rough very loudly with these militant fighters and I was I said Salam take it easy you know because you might actually piss them off and they will just you know just just uh, shoot you up so just relax take it easy he couldn't he was just going on and on again we were dumped inside few hours later again the door opens we are taken out and then I see a one civilian dressed individual who comes along with uh, with the same bunch of uh, fighters who had picked up uh, us and then they started talking now this gentleman who now I can say because things changed starts speaking in broken English so I could a bit start communicating so then he says okay who are you I said look I'm a Sahafi Sahafi means journalist I'm an Indian working for a French news agency and we have nothing uh, 
The French are not part of the forces which have invaded uh, Iraq. Neither is India involved. So why are you doing this? It just doesn't make sense. But the fighters are all yelling at you. No, no, no. These guys are Amriki jasus, Amriki spies. You know, you know, you have to kill them. They have this. They have a laptop. They have satellite. Everything. You know, all these suspicious instruments and devices. Nothing. You no, know, we we need to kill them. You know, somebody hitting with a gun. This, you know. Then there was this one fighter within within that group who was young, uh, like in his early 20s, 22, 23 year old young chap. He used a word like Bashan, Bashan. I couldn't understand instantly what it was. And I said, hello, hello? No, no, hello? He said, Shole, Shole. And that struck me. He was speaking of Amitabh Bachchan. You know, Bachchan. His pronunciation was Bachchan. I said, Amitabh Bachchan. Yes, Amitabh Bachchan. Amitabh Bachchan, Mazboot. He was a little strong. Amitabh Bachchan, Mazboot. That actually broke the ice. That broke the ice, and then from that, we could actually communicate with them and start telling them that, look, guys, you know, we are not what you think we are. Take it easy, calm down. And situation just changed dramatically. From what was a high tense situation, became completely cooled down, and I could start negotiating with them somehow how to try to get out. And I then I said that, look, you know, Islam doesn't uh, allow killing of uh, an innocent person, especially a journalist. And you are saying that you are finding a jihad war against Americans and all. Why do you want blood of journalists and your own Iraqi national? So that was a scary moment which dramatically changed. And uh, as I often tell Sudhin and, and various forums that, uh, yeah, thanks to Bachchan, you know. <laughs> I'm here today. And there have been many other incidents, but this has been now when I look back. This is one of those which really you live to tell. Well, thanks. We have got four, four speakers, and let me thank them all. They have given us sufficient material. Question, I'm going to say, from Gauri Lokan last year.